Hi there, I'm Paul Babb. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the laboratory of Dr. Benjamin Voigt at the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Perlman School of Medicine in the Department of um, Systems Pharmacology and Translational Therapeutics and the Department of Genetics. And today I get to talk to you about something that is near and dear to my heart, uh, spiders. Um, in particular, I'm gonna be talking to you about the amazing spider silk gene diversity that we see in the golden orb weaver spider's genome. So why spider silk? Well, spider silk is the t uh, spider silks are the toughest known biological materials on Earth. But not just that. They're tough, yes, but they're also light, elastic, and nearly immune, or no, nearly invisible to the human immune system. So what does all this mean? This is a material that has garnered lots of interest, especially in the medical and in industrial communities. Um, for potential biosynthesis, uh, for new products and innovation. And in fact, multiple new startups are, are popping up all the time, and large uh, groups are very interested in to see how to put spider silks out on the market for various products. Now you're asking, why can't you just get a bunch of spiders and pull a bunch of silk? Well, you can, but they're not great at being domesticated. And folks have known about the strength of silk for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and if you try and keep them in the captivity, they'll often eat each other. So folks are trying to find a different way to move, go about this. And they're, they're making some progress. In fact, uh, just last year, Adidas uh, started advertising a new shoe that they've uh, partnered up with to make uh, with a company called Amsilk. And th with, the, uh, with the purpose of being all biodegradable materials, so not uh, using um, rubbers or other things or other uh, um, products that could uh, be, have toxic runoff or um, other toxic properties of the manufacturing process. Um, meanwhile, uh, the North Face has put out a new jacket, uh, the Moon Parka, which is made out of synthetic spider silk, um, when teamed up with a Japanese company called Spiber. And this, the material that they've uh, woven on the external part of this jacket is, is very lightweight. So there's lots of interest, there's movement going forward. Um, so why don't we just jump in and make lots of spider silk? Well, um, the, the work that's been done has focused on a couple main spider proteins, and we'll, uh, or spider silk proteins, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but generally, there's quite a bit of uh, the puzzle missing here. And so what we're interested in is putting some more pieces together in that puzzle. So if you go outside and watch a spider uh, weave its web, you'll notice, first of all, that there are many, many kinds of spiders. In fact, there are 46,000 species of known spider, and that number is ticking up every month um, and probably reflects just a, a fraction of the number of spider species that are out there. Um, and quite a few of these are what are called orb weavers, about 8,000 species. Um, they build the typical orb or circular web. You'll probably see them on lots of Halloween decorations. Um, and if you'll, if you'll watch them build the web, you see that it's not just simple as uh, pulling out silk. In fact, they'll go through lots of motions. And um, not only that, but the typical female orb weaver actually has multiple silk glands, up to seven different ki kinds of anatomically differentiated silk glands to make these different kinds of silk in different parts of the web or for different uses. Um, for example, when building their web, uh, the female orb weaver will use uh, what's called major amplet silk to build the radii and structural strong parts, as well as their drag line, which they carry along as sort of their uh, repelling rope to move uh, and keep them safe. Um, and then they'll also use what's called minor amplet silk. Now this is an inelastic uh, temporary line that, that they use to go along and walk around as they make the orb. Um, I should mention that the major amplet uh, silk is the strongest of the silks. Um, in fact, it has uh, unparalleled uh, toughness and extensive uh, and um, strength as far as tension goes. Um, meanwhile, we've got piriform silk, which is used as the cement to bind silks to one another and to substrates that uh, the spider is building their web off of. We've got flagelliform silk, which is the super stretchy silk that goes into the spiral of the capture uh, or the capture spiral of the web. And this is the st silk that really withstands the impact of a, of a, of a flying insect or other uh, prey that might hit this web. Um, 
but it in itself isn't sticky and it won't hold that prey. So the spider then has to go along and coat that uh, um, flagelliform silk. And I should say here, this is for the viscous uh, silk making orb weavers. Um, there's also the cribbolet uh, style orb, orb weavers. But this uh, sticky viscous silk uh, is called aggregate. Um, and it is like drops of glue that go along the flagelliform silk. You then have a cineform silk, which the spider quickly makes to wrap up their prey. Um, it's also on the, it's the soft inner layer of their egg cases. And, on, and for um, protecting their spiderlings over the winter time, they use um, really strong outer silk called tubuliform silk. And as I've mentioned, there are other types of spiders and there may be other types of silk that we don't know about. So we, here we have a situation where we've got multiple types of silk glands in these orb weavers. They make multiple types of silk. Now the silks themselves are made up of what are called spidroan proteins. And this is a play on the word of a spider fibroan, fibroan being a uh, class of structural proteins. And just to, to revisit the central dogma of molecular bi biology, um, proteins, start out as a being coded by DNA. And DNA codes for these proteins first by making RNA, and that is the process called transcription. And uh, the RNA are these uh, uh, pieces that move around the cell or that are then transferred uh, and translated into proteins. And proteins are, um, are the, both the structural and the active parts of the cell. Um, of, and uh, spider silks are actually one of the few uh, types of proteins that are used by organisms outside of their body um, for both uh, prey capture and reproductive purposes. So spidrone proteins are encoded by genes. Here's a spidrone gene. Spidrone genes contain lots of repeats. Now why am I telling you about repeats? Well, as genomicists, we think a lot about repeats. Um, let's take this toy example here. Pretend I had a chunk of DNA sequence. Now, pretend I got some money and was able to do some sequencing using a new generation of sequencing uh, machines and chemistry. And I took a bit of DNA and I chopped it up into lots of little pieces. And then the machine gave me back the reads from that sequencing run. So the way you'd normally go about reconstructing parts of this DNA, either whether you know what you started with or what you, whether you didn't, is by aligning these pieces of, of these short fragments of DNA. And for most of the genome, we can actually kind of do this pretty well, where there's logical connections between the reads that you've created, the little fragments, and overlapping bits that can help you reconstruct uh, the original uh, sequence. Now, repeats are a different story. Imagine I've got a sequence like this, and I did my sequencing, and I, I wound up with a lot of small reads. Well, if I try and take this first read and map it up to the, to the original genome, or I'm trying to align it with either uh, other small pieces, it can go in many, many places, and those, those are called multi-mappers. Now, this makes computers really, really sad. And in fact, you can, it of, often um, doesn't even allow you to reconstruct repetitive regions. So you've got a situation where the really, really interesting genes regarding related to spider silk are just chock full of these repeats, um, and meaning that a lot of the information that we have about these genes in these different spiders is quite fragmentary. So not only are they hard to assemble, but the repeats are incredibly important to the overall structure of the, this particular protein. Um, why are they important? Well, if we do look in closely at the nucleotide sequence, these are the bases, the A's, G's, C's, and T's that make up um, the genome, we look at the, that sequence, they code for particular repetitive sequences of amino acids. Now, these amino acids are themselves arranged in repetitive patterns called motifs. Now, the motifs fall in the, have been categorized pretty well. Um, and um, scientists have actually spent decades trying to understand the relationship of particular motifs to the overall protein structure. So certain uh, motifs code for, let's say, beta uh, spirals, and others code for beta sheets. Um, and why does this matter? Well, 
the, these structures actually give the particular protein different physical properties. Um, so particular uh, beta spirals, let's say, in this uh, GPGQQ motif may make uh, that little bit of the protein a little bit more elastic, whereas a polyalanine motif might make a little bit of that protein uh, strong. So the patterns in which these are arrayed in a silk gene actually can give different silk genes different physical properties, or the proteins that they make. So we've got increasing levels of complexity here. Again, we've got multiple uh, types of silk uh, that the spider can make, um, and that even the production of silk uh, itself, going from protein to a final silk, is complex as well. So if we looking at, uh, look at some silk under a scanning electron microscope, um, one thing you'll see is that it's incredibly tiny. And on this picture, this is actually human hair, and here's the silk. So we have to zoom in even further. And when you get to the silk itself, uh, you can see that a lot of the silks are actually composed of multiple fibers, and those are made up with maybe multiple different types of silk proteins. Um, again, there's a, it's hard to get at what is composing the silk, because if you um, break apart the sequence of those proteins, let's say, you'll also see repeats. And ascribing them to their original uh, um, gene is difficult. So we've got the different uh, types of uh, silk that the spider uses in the web. We've got different silk glands that the spider may use to, in different combinations to make the different kinds of silk. So what is going on? Um, again, we, we know full length sequences for just a couple of the, these silk proteins. How do we learn more? Um, one question that's out there is also, how is this produced? Uh, is it like a fishing lure? Well, probably not. This, a lot of these uh, proteins start in a liquid form, um, and then as they um, are processed by the spider, they become hard or stay liquid. Um, is it more like a toothpaste? Probably not, that's a little simplistic. We've got multiple glands and many spigots coming out of this gland that go to the spinner outs of the spider. Um, I like to think of it more of a, as like a bartender soda gun where you've got lots of different buttons and lots of different combinations that you can put together to make your different products. But there are a lot of things we still don't know. Um, one thing that I've tried to put out here for you is that we still don't know the number of spidrones in an orb weaving spider species. We don't know their full sequences and the repetitive content of those spidrones. And we don't know um, how spidrones are expressed in different silk gland tissues of orb weaving spiders. So this leads us to three fundamental questions. Number one, how many spidrones are there in an orb weaving spider species? Number two, what is their structure? And number three, how are they expressed? So let's try and see what genomics can do to help us tackle these questions. And we'll start with our first questions. How many spidrones? Well, to determine the number of spidrone genes in a spider species, we need, first of all, a spider that makes many kinds of silk. It's full genome sequence, so you can actually start digging through it and finding bits and pieces, or hopefully the full parts of these spidrone genes and the sequences and locations of all the genes um, so that we can compare and contrast how those uh, spidrones may be turned on and off. So let's start. Fortunately, here in the US, in the southeast part of the country, we've got um, along the barrier islands and swampy marsh uh, woodland barriers, uh, we've got a beautiful orb weaver, makes webs up to about almost a meter across. Um, and this is called the golden orb weaver, Nephiloclavipes. It also has many other common names like the banana spider or the hand spider, because by the end of the summer, these females can be about as big as your hand. Um, but they're pretty harmless, they're actually quite blind. They'll sit there and uh, in the middle of their web and they'll feel vibrations move quickly, but you can get up pretty close to them. Um, but they build these beautiful webs with many different kinds of silk. In fact, their silk is very strong and it's five times uh, tougher than Kevlar, and Kevlar being the material uh, made in bulletproof vests. So starting off, there's no genome for this particular spider, even though it has been studied for decades and has even been called um, 
by esteemed uh, arachnologists as the the workhorse, the ubiquitous workhorse of spider silk research. So we live in a day and age where we can actually build a genome relatively easily, um, thanks to the efforts of the Human Genome Project and new technologies, both on the computational and the chemistry side. Uh, this is something that a small group can actually get together and with a lot of hard work put together a, a full genome. So think of it, what is a genome? Think of it this way. If a gene is a book, that gives you a recipe for a protein, then the genome is like a library, right? And it's got all the books, all the protein codes for that organism. Unfortunately, you can't just assemble it or sequence and assemble it all at once. Um, the technology just isn't quite there yet to do, you know, you put in some DNA and get the entire genome back and um, that's, that's how it works. Um, unfortunately, what you have to do is you have to break up um, all the, the genome into little bits. But um, thanks to new technological innovations uh, through what's called high throughput sequencing, we can process millions and millions of these small pieces of the, of the genome at a time and then try and reassemble them. How do we do this? Well, first we need DNA. So we catch some spiders and um, extract DNA from their cells using um, combinations of uh, salts and other buffers. And you wind up with DNA that you purify, and you take that and you chop it up, and you uh, then move on to high put, uh, sequencing, high throughput sequencing. Here you take the DNA fragments and bind them to what's essentially a really, really heavily modified microscope slide that the DNA can bind to. And this is processed in a machine that uses fluorescent dyes and lasers to look at the sequences of all these little fragments. And what this machine puts out are those sequences um, in very short reads in a huge text file that then you get to play with on the computer. Um, when you're playing with this and you want to build the genome, you do what's called de novo genome assembly uh, in this case, where by de novo I mean you're building it from scratch. You don't have a reference. Um, there is another spider that has been referenced, uh, actually two. Um, but Spiders are pretty ancient. They go back about 400 plus million years. So aligning sequences from uh, distant related uh, species doesn't always work. So we have to take a de novo approach. Mm -hmm. And the way this works is you've got lots of little uh, short fragments that you start overlapping and you do your best to build bigger and bigger overlapped pieces called contigs. But because of those repeats I described earlier, you're gonna have places where you just can't read anymore, you can't align anymore or overlap anymore. Uh, so you have gaps and then use different kinds of uh, short reads, maybe ones that you know longer distance is about, uh, to map onto the contigs you've already built. And you create what are called scaffolds. So these are linked contigs that maybe have gaps in them, but you know the, about the distance between them. And you do this again and again and again. Uh, to try and extend the edges out a little bit, to double check the, the uh, linkages you're making between the contigs, and you try and close the gaps as best you can. And it's never quite perfect. Um, there's always gonna be some areas you just can't move through with uh, the current instruments of today and aligners, um, but you get as close as you can to have the entire genome covered in as few chunks as possible. Now, doing this, it's, I've made it sound a little bit uh, simpler than it probably is. It's incredibly computationally intensive. So fortunately, we had uh, facilities here at Penn um, um, that have massive computer, high-performance computing clusters, including um, a 1.7 terabyte uh, machine that we were uh, able to use and process over 1.8 billion reads that we've created from multiple runs, sequenced from uh, many, many different small fragments of DNA from these spiders. And doing that took 15 days, nonstop. Uh, and we did this about 20 times to make sure we were right. Well over 20 times, but let's say 20 for here. Now, to give you a sense of what this computing power is like, um, let's say you had your, your newest, hottest smartphone, right? Probably two gigs of RAM. How long would this take? Well, it would take about 35 years to do it once. 
So that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, intensive computing. Um, but thankfully, we can do these massive uh, parallel computing jobs these days and actually come up with some sort of a genome. Uh, what does the genome look like? Well, the draft uh, assembly um, from the Golden Orb Weaver spider, um, it's pretty big. We can see the size and structure of it pretty well in what we've assembled. Um, it's around the size of the human genome, and actually spider genomes uh, vary in size, as estimated, quite a bit. But this one's about 3.45 billion nucleotides, and we've got it arranged on about 182,000 scaffolds. Um, and each one of the nucleotides that we've validated, we have covered by at least 98 reads in those places. So we've got 98x coverage is what's that called. So we're pretty sure of the sequence that we've put together and we're ready to move on. Um, but with the genome, we still have a big question. Where are these genes? Because we want to find the spidrone genes. Well, we have to take on a new level of experiment to help find where those genes are. And this is where RNA sequencing comes in. And I described RNA earlier as what the, the code that uh, DNA helps um, transfer information to to get to the protein. Um, and we can get the RNA by dissecting many spiders and different tissues from them. And in this case, we dissected uh, all the silk glands we could, venom glands, brain tissue, as well as some whole body uh, spiders that we put in just to cover our bases. Um, like the DNA sequencing, we have to chop up all the RNA into small bits. And this is sequenced similarly on a, um, on a, a high throughput sequencer. And from that, we get the reads again, in small fragments. And we can build those into what are called the transcripts. So these are the, the short fragments or components of RNAs um, that are produced by the genome in those uh, tissues. And we take those transcripts and we map them back to the genome that we just built. And where they lie and, um, can help us understand where the genes may be. Now, I didn't mention we also pull in a lot of external uh, protein and RNA information to, uh, from other species uh, to look at conserved regions to also help annotate those uh, gene boundaries. Um, we then go, uh, performed a huge literature and public database search to look for anything that looked like a spidrone gene. Um, and as I mentioned, the, these are often fragmentary, um, bits of repeat, bits of um, terminal ends of these uh, uh, genes and proteins, but we got everything we could to throw at our new genome to see where, which one, where the genes might lie that could be coding for spidrones. And we got about 600 uh, spidrone fragments from the literature and the um, public databases. And we compared those not only to our genome, but also the golden orb weaver uh, transcripts that we uh, construct from the RNA-seq and to the genes themselves that we pulled out from our uh, gene mapping experiments. Um, we then line them up with the, uh, the publicly available data and try and get at wh where and how many of those genes might be um, spidrones. And from that, we get about 30 possible uh, spidrone sequences. Now, this is uh, an increase quite a bit of what we knew about um, for a single species. Um, uh, the, the velvet spider, um, which came out, cat uh, cataloged about 14 to 19, depending on the ends you're looking at, uh, um, silk uh, genes. So this, we were looking at more than what was previously described, so we really wanted to make sure that what we were seeing was real and not just an artifact of the alignments. Um, but we, did, we do have a starting number. So, um, how many spidrones? Well, we answer this question by assembling the entire golden orb, golden orb weaver spider genome. Uh, we assembled the RNA transcripts from 17 different tissues um, to help us define where those genes are. Um, we defined over 14,000 high quality gene models, and by that, by high quality, I mean we had multiple lines of evidence pointing to the actual boundaries of those genes and evidence of RNA being active there. Um, and from those, we pulled out about 30 spidrone genes. So now that we've got this collection of possible uh, spidrone genes, we, we want to start looking at their structure because that's where you start 
you know, letting the rubber hit the road. When you can start looking at the structure of these different uh, spike drone genes, you can start understanding more about the properties of the proteins that they make. So to understand the structure of these spike drone genes, uh, we need a couple things too. Uh, we need full spike drone gene sequences. As I mentioned, repeats are hard and um, there hasn't been a lot out there on uh, complete sequences. We need a catalog of the repeat motifs, so the, the small atomistic, like minuscule chunks of the repeats that um, pass on the physical properties. We need, need a catalog of all of those for all the spy drones. And um, it'd be helpful to understand motif sharing uh, across the spy drones. And by that I mean seeing which uh, motifs are shared in which spy drones and wh what we know about those spy drones or relatives and what we can understand about um, how that might change the properties of those proteins and thus the silks they're incorporated in. The reason being there, there may be unknown spy drones out there and uh, this would allow us to form hypotheses about what those unknown spy drones might look like. It also gives a big um, help if you're trying to talk about uh, synthetic um, pro uh, silk proteins um, that some of these companies are trying to put together because you could maybe put together combinations of motifs that are not seen in nature. So um, fun, interesting things there, even though it's a, uh, a repetitive uh, algorithmic problem. So I wish I had a big plate of spy drones to show you, uh, or at least that came off the initial draft genome sequence run. But unfortunately, because of this repeats, what we saw was a lot of fragmented or um, incomplete spy drone gene sequences. We'd have cases where we had the gene pretty well mapped out, but there's a big gap in the middle and we didn't know really the range of size that, um, or the internal sequence that might be there. Um, and then we had cases where we had an end of a spy drone hanging off uh, the, the end of, a, of a, a scaffold, and then maybe another part over on another scaffold, and just a, a good guess on which ones might be um, paired up. So to, to solve this issue, uh, we took advantage of some other things. Um, there's uh, some uh, experimental techniques uh, to go after long fragments of sequence um, in a DNA. By, and thanks to the genome we built, we actually can uh, take advantage of those, uh, of those techniques by capturing long fragments. And then there's uh, uh, recently been a new type of sequencing that's arisen. Um, so we capture the long fragments using a um, technique called long range PCR, which I won't get into now, but um, we take those long fragments and feed them into these new machines. And these new machines um, hit the market a couple years ago and what they can do is rather than reading lots and lots of uh, short sequences at one time, these do what is called single molecule real time sequencing or smart sequencing in that they um, they take a single long molecule and pass it over an enzyme and use fluorescence and, uh, and lasers to detect the sequence, just with fewer pieces but at a longer length. So we thought that this would be a great approach to apply uh, for our uh, spy drone sequences. So we grab the chunks as best we can. And for those ones that we, um, we they were hanging off the end of the scaffolds, we just tried lots of combinations, and if they weren't connected, they wouldn't turn up as a fragment. Um, but we were able to connect uh, almost all of them and put them in the pool to sequence. So how did this work out? Um, quite well. We got actually thousands and thousands and thousands of long reads for each particular spy drone that we targeted. And these allowed us um, to align the long pieces and rectify the, uh, the number and sequence of the repetitive motifs within each one of these spy drones. So from this, we actually have a, a final tally that we're pretty happy with uh, for the golden orb weaver spider um, spy drone uh, genes. And looking at that together, we were able to build, this is a gene tree I have here, and um, the associations here are, are taken from and the relationships of these different genes, here's the structure of the gene and then their names and then the types of sequence that they are uh, connected to as far as what the literature has found or where 
uh, the, the particular gland in which the um, initial gene was first cloned. Um, this is looking at the non-repetitive parts of the, of the spideron genes and creating a, a gene family tree of all of them. Um, and from this, we came up with 28 spidrones that we have validated using the smart sequencing. Um, and from all 20 of those, we have full, complete uh, sequences. There were still some that we just could not get all the way, and we're still working on them. I'm going to wrap that up. Um, of the ones that we were able to put together, uh, we see all the seven uh, classic orb weaver spidron classes um, that have been defined in the, in the literature. Um, and we also see eight spidrones that look different and uh, for what has been described in the past and beg further investigation. Um, so how do we find the repeats? Well, now that we have full length sequences, we want to look at the repeats and the motifs. So you can take it, take the sequence, and stare at it by eye, but you'll go insane. So instead, we use a series of computer algorithms to search for enrichment and, uh, of patterns of amino acids in these sequences. And what that gives us are these, as I'm showing you here in these colored plots, sequences that are enriched, like we can see the poly A uh, motif right here. We take those enriched parts of the sequence and we map them on back onto the gene to see the colors uh, visually representing the different motifs along that gene. Um, here's the start and the end and different patterns of motifs in there. Um, but it's not done the first time. We have to do this again and again to refine and get a smaller and smaller definitional boundary for all of these motifs. And we end up with final resolved painted uh, repeat patterns on these spy drones. Now that we've got the, uh, all the spy drones painted, we can then begin looking at how those motifs may be shared across spy drones. So we ask the question, do different golden orb weaver spy drones share motifs? Well, when looking at all of them and categorizing motifs both on an um, individual motif variant level, because there's some wiggle on what uh, consists of a motif, uh, we categorize them in, on bigger classes as well, motifs that look similar to other motifs, and we see tremendous sharing across all of the spy drones. This makes sense. It's a gene family, so they are, there's an evolutionary relationship between all of these uh, um, spy drone genes. Um, but most of the motifs are shared, in, at least with one other or perhaps more spy drone uh, genes. And the numbers that we found, we found 394 unique motif variants. Um, these fall into about 49 classes that, um, and that we actually see <clears throat> most motifs are shared across spidrone genes, and that sharing even occurs across the spidrone classes. So we see major amplet genes having motifs that we also see in minor amplet uh, genes, and those have motifs that we also may see in the flagelliform genes. So there's a lot of back and forth um, they're not always in the same arrangement, um, but that may tell us something about how those proteins are used in the silks and how that gives the, the silks different physical properties. So we asked the question going into this, what is the structure of the golden orb weaver spy drones? Well, we got at it by validating 28 of the spy drones and assembled complete sequences for 20 of them. We cataloged hundreds of repetitive coding motifs and quantified the number of motifs and the amount of sharing that is occurring across the genes. So we're getting to our last question here that we wanted to address with this. How are these spidron genes expressed in the different silk tissues? Well, to understand how spidrons are expressed, we need a couple things. We need spidron gene expression values from a full set of the silk gland tissues, um, as well as biological replicates, because one spider might express these things a little different from another spider. So we want to look at multiple spiders and the, their levels of expression. And we also want to take a look at uh, co-expression patterns. And what I mean by that is which genes are turned on or turned off in the same tissues um, together, as that may give us hints as how the, uh, the actual silk is produced 
and in what combinations of the different silk proteins and uh, what tissues are responsible for different types of silk and whether or not uh, there's a really discrete relationship between certain glands and certain uh, classes of silk protein. So to act, uh, address this question, we used uh, quantitative PCR. This is a process by uh, which you can label um, RNA um, and measure it in different tissues. So we obtained the three replicate specimens of uh, mature females. I ran down to South Carolina and, and grabbed some up, um, actually just this summer to, to wrap this part up, and um, rushed back to Philadelphia and um, had the wonderful collaborative help of um, some really world famous uh, arachnologists who are exquisite at uh, dissecting uh, silk glands. Now, if, just take for a second and think about what it might be like to dissect a silk gland. Um, if we've ever you know, stepped on a spider or something, you know that it's, it's not always clear what's inside. And in fact, with a lot of these techniques, you have to use a massive microscope and um, actually float out the uh, silk glands on uh, an aqueous solution to get them separated. Um, so Dr. Cheryl Hayashi and uh, her graduate student, Sandra Correa Garwal, were kind enough to um, process all of the silk glands from these three females, and as well as some other tissues. Um, we did, uh, we looked at legs and head tissue. Uh, we looked at venom glands specifically, and um, to basically compare and contrast what should and what should not have um, silk uh, gene expression going on in those tissues. For all of them, we extracted the, DNA, or the RNA and converted that into what's called cDNA. That's complementary DNA. So you're taking a, a single-stranded RNA and reversing it and then making a double-stranded sort of pseudo-DNA. And the reason that we do that is that the double-stranded DNA can be incorporated in this process of uh, quantitative PCR wherein um, fluorescent dye is run along the DNA fragment, and this is picked up by a laser on these machines. Um, and as more and more copies are present in a given uh, tissue, you can read how much of the different RNA levels are there through this labeled DNA, or cDNA. So we did this for all of our tissues and all of the replicates and, on, and lots and lots of technical replicates. Um, and then we compared the RNA levels across the different silk glands um, for the different uh, spidrone genes. And what do we find? Well, not surprisingly, spidrone expression is quite complex. Um, we did have sam uh, examples where um, here I'm showing you um, a bar plot of um, the, the uh, gene expression levels of one of the minor amplet silks. So now remember, this is an inelastic temporary silk and you might expect it to be highly expressed in, say, minor amplet glands, and that's what we see. We see it um, significantly expressed in the minor amplet glands, both over, uh, over the leg tissue and venom gland tissue, as well as um, all, over all of the other silk glands. So that sort of fits with the, the nice, clean description um, that uh, has actually been pushed against quite a bit in the arachnologist community who know that biology is more complex than, than lots of pretty pictures that you might see in the, on the internet. Um, but it's, it doesn't just stop there. We also see examples where we see um, expression of certain silk genes. In this case, it's a, uh, an aggregate spy, spy drone. So this is the viscous sticky, sticky uh, protein uh, that uh, is placed on the um, the spiral for orb weaving spiders. We see this one um, expressed significantly high in all of the silk glands. Um, it's certainly high in the aggregate silk gland, but all of the other ones are expressing it pretty high too. Um, and the, the scale in both of these, this is a log scale, so we go orders of magnitude up. So um, this is, these are all really highly turned on in the different silk glands. Um, Doing this, we also saw something else, something we didn't expect, expect at all. Now, um, if you'll recollect from the other um, pictures that I showed, there were a couple of these flagelliform spidrones. Um, and you would expect, perhaps, these flagelliform spidrones, of which there were two, flag A and flag B, 
to be highly expressed in flagelliform gland. And here I'm showing you a similar plot as the one on the last slide. And flagelliform A certainly is expressed quite high in the flagelliform gland, but flag, flag B, not so much. Um, certainly more than PR1. PR1 is a venom toxin. Um, we used as a uh, negative control to show, to compare back to, um, but not not really high as one would expect. So we asked the question, well, where is it being expressed? And oddly enough, flag B was highly expressed in venom glands. Now we were we re repeated these ex experiments many times because this was just like totally odd. Uh, and we looked back actually at our RNA-seq data, so with different individuals and a different technology, and saw the same patterns. Um, and, and so it looks like we've got a situation where we may have a spidroin that has been reappropriated some way. Some way. Now all of these comparisons between the, the two uh, tissues and the three genes I'm here, showing here and the differences between them are all significant. Um, but what this, these, this particular pattern of expression might mean, uh, we, we've come up with some wacky ideas, but we're not sure. And uh, one of the big questions that remains is, is, is flag B actually getting translated in, or into a protein? Uh, that would be the, the next experiment to look at. But we can certainly say um, confidently that it is not highly expressed in the silk glands, but instead is up in the venom glands. Now, last for the expression work, we also wanted to see the patterns of co-expression. Um, in which spidrones are turned on and off in these tissues, um, in, and whether or not they're um, being turned on and off with other ones in uh, reproducible fashion. So this is just a zoom in of, of um, a couple of these spidrones I'm showing you here. Uh, I've got several of the major ampullate uh, spidrones, a couple uh, aggregate spidrones, um, some flagelliform, and what I'm showing you is a, is a heat map and this is comparing the level of transcription across all of the different tissues and the particular pattern for a given gene versus itself and all the others. So you would expect, if you look at the diagonal, if I take major amplets by drawing H and I compare it to itself, it should be highly correlated with red. Um, and what we see are patterns in which certain Spidrones, in this case, major amplet spidrone H, is highly, uh, is, has similar expression patterns as these other major amplets, including itself, as well as this unknown uh, uh, spidrone, one that didn't really have sequence similar enough to major amplet spidrones, or at least those that have been described in other species or fragments in the databases, um, but yet is turned on in a similar fashion across the different tissues. And so what this lets us do is we can also, we can begin clustering these groups of spidrons to see which ones are on and off, but it helps us un understand a little bit more about some of these unknown ones. For example, spidron 74867 is on with the major amplets uh, in this case, and spidron 8175 is on with a couple of these aggregates. Uh, we see this spidron uh, 5803 on with the flagelliform, highly expressed in fl flagelliform gland. And again, we see the pattern popping up of co-expression of this uh, PR1, this venom gene, and flag B. Um, another line of evidence uh, showing that odd pattern of expression I just showed to you. So when we ask this question of how they are expressed, how the different spidrones are expressed, well, we learned quite a few things. We learned that uh, spidrones do exhibit complex expression patterns that are not always based on sequence or class, um, and that spidrone's expression is not even necessarily restricted to the, to the silk gland tissue itself, um, and certainly begs additional investigation. Um, and finally, that co-expression patterns can help us not only learn which, gene, which silk genes are turned on and off, um, but maybe what some of these unknown spidrones are doing and how they may work together in different silks that they're being used in. Um, so all of this, again, it's this, uh, this complex nature of spideron pr production that I think fits the, uh, the soda gun analogy quite well. Um, you've got a lot of options and a lot of uh, different mixtures that you can make uh, for different uses. So in talking to you guys today, I've asked three fundamental questions that we uh, used our uh, 
uh, Golden Orb Weaver genome to address. Uh, number one, how many, spy, how many spy drones are there in a species? Uh, what is their structure and how they are, are they expressed? And I hope that I've been able to show you that uh, genomics has been able to provide us with quite a few answers. Um, number one, uh, we were able to reconstruct 28 spy drones for a single species. Um, there, there's a large number of repetitive coding motifs uh, that may confer physical properties to the different proteins. And many of these are shared, but not necessarily in the same combinations. This gives us a lot to work with as far as uh, synthetic production of, of novel silk types. And um, spidrone expression itself is not gland specific, nor is it even restricted to silk gland tissue. So that, again, provides many avenues of research. Um, but we've really only scratched the surface. We've looked at one spider. Again, there's 46,000 species of spider, many which have different silk toolkits, different silks that they can use, it may produce different silk proteins. Um, but we get, so we get to, but we, we've scratched the surface, we have a resource, and we can begin moving on to some of these tougher questions, like, for example, what does another orb weaver um, and its genome look like? So, this is a, a question that we want to use and why uh, to address the big question uh, to why is, is spider, spider silk so strong? What gives it its properties for a given species for, over another? Well, as I've said, we have one orb weaver spider genome, our beautiful golden orb weaver from the US. Uh, but we can build more and we can compare them. So here I have uh, Sarostra starwini, that's a, it's another orb weaver, and it's called Darwin's bark spider. So what's so special about Darwin's bark spider? Why would we want to compare it to our uh, wonderfully local and uh, large, strong, silk spinning uh, spider? Well, Darwin's bark spider was discovered a couple of years ago by our collaborators, 2009 actually, um, in the middle of Madagascar, and it builds pretty big webs. Not only that, it builds webs across rivers. So just think of this. This is 25 meters across for this bridge line going across here. 25 meters. It makes the world's largest orb webs. And it does all this using the world's strongest silk. This is 15 times stronger than Kevlar. Again, bulletproof vest. 15 times. So if we can learn a little bit about what this particular spider has to say about its spidron gene diversity, just imagine the cool things that we can begin doing. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you for letting me talk to you about this today. Um, I have a lot of uh, many thanks to give to many wonderful collaborators, arachnologists, bioinformaticians, cluster computing experts, uh, web lab bench experts, um, and just folks who have been very patient with me listening to spiders for all these years. So thank you.